Chapter 6, Section 3. This video lecture covers cellular transport. Our learning outcome. I want you to be able to explain how substances like electrolytes and sugars or even oxygen, carbon dioxide, how these things can exit cells through diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or active transport. To understand cellular transport, always remember form equals function. The structure of the cellular membrane is important for regulating what enters or exits the cell. Don't forget, those fatty acid tails that form a cellular membrane, they're hydrophobic, meaning the interior of the cell membrane is hydrophobic. So only certain things can pass through, and they can pass through through either passive transport, which includes diffusion and facilitated diffusion, or active transport. Let's take a closer look. Let's begin with simple diffusion. A substance travels down its concentration gradient. So for example, oxygen is a small nonpolar molecule. It can readily diffuse across the cellular membrane. In addition to oxygen, carbon dioxide can also simply diffuse across the membrane because carbon dioxide is also a small hydrophobic molecule. Water is, can also diffuse through a cellular membrane as well. Even though water is a polar molecule, it can still readily diffuse through it because it's small, although it doesn't go through a membrane quite as fast as oxygen or carbon dioxide. Now, simple diffusion is an example of passive transport. Remember, the cell is not expending any energy here. It's just using the kinetic energy that's already in the system. When it comes to diffusion, each substance, whether it's oxygen or carbon dioxide or water, they're going to each diffuse independently of each other. And most things will diffuse independently of each other unless there are ions present. And I'm going to come back to that point in a few minutes. Recall that cellular membranes have selective permeability. Now what that means is not everything can pass through that hydrophobic interior. That includes our ions, such as sodium ions. So we have to facilitate their diffusion. And the way we do that is by having a membrane channel. So one of the ones we might have is a sodium ion channel. We can also do this for potassium as well. And potassium will go down its ion channel because they can't pass through the cellular membrane on their own. Chloride is also another electrolyte that will diffuse across a membrane by using some type of membrane protein. Now each one of these electrolytes will diffuse down their concentration gradient independently of each other up to a point. Here's what happens. Each electrolyte will diffuse down its concentration gradient independently of itself, also known as its chemical gradient. However, electrolytes are also influenced by electrical gradients as well. Remember, electrolytes are ions, which are charged particles. And we know that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So if you start getting a whole bunch of cations on one side of the membrane, that's also going to affect the diffusion of these electrolytes across these membranes by traveling through their protein channels. One other type of cellular transport is active. Active transport, here you're going to move a solute against a concentration gradient. Now this is similar to kicking a ball up a hill. You need a couple things here. Active transport, where we're going to move these calcium ions against their concentration gradient, requires a protein pump and a source of energy. You have to have both of them. The protein pump physically moves the calcium ions from one side of the membrane to the other, and the source of energy allows you to do it against this concentration gradient. And these calcium pumps, they're common in your muscles, specifically in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's part of your smooth ER that stores calcium ions. So every time your muscles relax, the sarcoplasmic reticulum pumps calcium ions back inside, outside of the cytoplasm. An important example of active transport are the sodium potassium pumps. And in fact, you spend about 20% of your energy budget on moving potassium inside your cell and moving sodium outside your cell. And you may notice for every three sodiums, there are two potassiums. The pump works with the addition of a phosphate group from ATP. By doing so, it changes the shape of the pump and it brings a potassium in and the sodium will now exit the outside of the cell. The sodium potassium pump works because for every two potassium ions pumped into the cell, what happens? The three sodium ions are pumped out and that creates your chemical gradient. And the pump is constantly changing shape with the addition or the removal of a phosphate group. 
Because of active transport, and you have three positively charged sodium ions put outside of the cell for every two positively charged potassium ions brought into the cell, what happens is you get a difference in charge across the membrane. We call this a membrane potential. So the outside of the cell becomes slightly positively charged and the inside becomes negatively charged. The combination of a chemical gradient, which is where I have more sodium ions on one side of the membrane than the other, and the membrane potential, where it's more positively charged than the other side, creates what we call an electrochemical gradient. And electrochemical gradients, they store potential energy, just like a battery. If you notice a battery has a plus and a minus end, and we can use the energy stored in a battery to do work. Well, cells can actually store energy as an electrochemical gradient, and they use that energy to do work. So active transport is incredibly important for cells to create and maintain these electrochemical gradients so they can do work. For example, here's our health connections to active transport, facilitated transport, and diffusion. Basically, all cells have to maintain homeostasis, and cellular transport helps maintain homeostasis. By maintaining electrolyte balances through both active transport and facilitated diffusion, you can maintain your water balance. So if your cell is isotonic, it's going to stay about the same size. If you become in a hypertonic solution, the cell may shrink as it loses water. And in this case, cells may actually have to pump in electrolytes to maintain water balance. If a cell gets into a hypotonic solution, it may actually have to pump out electrolytes to maintain proper water balance. So cells are constantly moving things across their membranes to maintain water and electrolyte balance. Another health connection with water and electrolyte balance has to do with diarrhea. Now we all know what diarrhea is, and in the US it's a minor inconvenience, although it can be a pretty big inconvenience. But worldwide, diarrhea kills people. It has caused millions of deaths worldwide. Cholera is one of the bacteria that causes it. The way cholera works is it gets into your intestines and basically it releases toxins that reduce your cell's ability to maintain proper electrolyte balance. So basically it's affecting facilitated diffusion. What happens is it basically opens up your ion channels in your intestines. By doing so, the ions in your cells flood out into your intestines and lowers the water potential. By lowering the water potential, well, you know that water always flows from high potential to low potential. So the water diffuses through osmosis through your cells into your intestines where they swell up with water and then you lose that water's diarrhea. So by losing both electrolytes and water, you can become dehydrated very rapidly and you can suffer electrolyte imbalances. And as I said earlier, cholera can actually kill you within almost 24 hours.